Let's talk about five, five hormones that for women at midlife make a huge difference in how we will not only coast through menopause with or without additional weight gain and belly fat or hot flashes, night sweats, but also for the rest of our life. So let's say it this way. Your menopause determines your longevity. And by that, it's not just do I or don't I have hot flashes, do I or don't I have night sweats or insomnia and things that are pesky and a nuisance, or do I sail through it much more smoothly? But changes that are happening, even that you maybe can't see or feel in terms of the sweat or the loss of sleep, could be affecting you or definitely are. Let's just say that they are affecting the way that you will age. So I'm going to dive into these five hormones. And there's probably a dozen or more that I talk about most frequently with our Flipping 50 Menopause Fitness Specialists, but we're just going to go with five today and you'll be armed and dangerous. So let's talk about number one, estrogen. So as women go through perimenopause into postmenopause, I mean, this is the one that is like, Duh. we're coming down and then it's like, we're done. Okay. We hit menopause and Menopause for women is like that. It's like coming to the edge of cliff, you jump off, step off, get pushed off, you know, and men come in for a landing. You know, it's a little bit more smooth and they definitely do have an andropause. Ours tends to be on average right at around 51.3. None of us are average. So it, it happened earlier or it happened later and a few of you are right there in the sweet spot, but average doesn't necessarily mean anything to any of us except, okay, we probably know that in our 40s, we're on that runway approaching menopause. And, you know, I've got clients I've worked with who are 58, 59, still having a regular period, no signs of disruption. So, you know, know that it could happen to you. You know, you never know. So estrogen, though, is responsible for really so much in our bodies for reproduction. And muscle and bone also rely on stimulus for, for from estrogen. So here's the way it works. And what happens as your estrogen comes down, you may notice that you're doing all the work, right? you're doing the, the exercise training, you're even strength training as you should and need to be. And it's not working quite as well. One of the things that estrogen does is helps a complete and full contraction of the muscle. So if you're not you know, under the influence of estrogen in the same way you were, you're essentially not getting the natural dose you had washing over you, your same exercise is not going to work as well. And estrogen is a national or is a natural stimulant for muscle. So you've got this already working for you to maintain it, to gain it if you're trying to gain it, meaning resistance type exercise. Any type of exercise will increase your muscle compared to not exercising at all. But resistance training is really the one we associate most with let's give you an overload and let's gain lean muscle that way. And if we're talking about the strength training in order to really gain strength, not endurance, we need to pick up weights and we need to lift them fewer times, but make sure that it's heavy enough for us to reach muscular fatigue or get get somewhat close to it. So estrogen will help with that naturally. So as we don't have that anymore, we have to have something to pick up the slack for muscle protein synthesis. Now that means that you're building up your muscle because of the, I can take in the protein that I'm eating. It's full of essential amino acids. Those are the parts that make up the protein that go into building block for your muscle as well as for bone. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but you don't have that same support from estrogen doing it anymore. So when estrogen is gone, the resistance training that you were doing, you might have to do that a little bit more intensely. Really prioritize that. It's not pink dumbbells anymore. You've got to pick up the heavier dumbbells. Do some heavier lifting as safe as as long as you safely can. So you're you're looking for where's my sweet spot? No injury, no injury, but benefit. And and as soon as the risk begins to outweigh the reward, you're out. You're dropping back down. You're finding something else that works better in order to do it. So it's always a risk reward ratio. So when we're looking at the the 
use of estrogen, what it did for us when we had it in abundance, we probably much more easily had muscle, muscle tone. We could see results of our exercise better, easier, faster. We were getting rewarded for the work we were doing. Now we may feel like I'm shooting blanks, like <laughs> I'm doing the work, but I'm not seeing it. And it, part of it is, again, we've got less estrogen, so we're getting less stimulus in the first place. The same thing we used to do will not be as effective anymore. You've got to up it a notch. But you're also potentially, if you're without estrogen, not getting that full contraction. There's a couple things going on. So a number of muscle fibers, they may not all be called to attention. The fibers are not all stimulated as intensely. They're not all getting the message that right now, I want you to come out and play. Let's do your job. And part of that was estrogen's job, not there. So we've got to work a little bit harder and or... For those of you who are choosing HRT, here's what I can tell you, and this is no argument, no persuasive argument whatsoever for HRT or not, whichever your choice is, I would just want to make sure that you're all informed, that you're making your informed decision on what's true in 2024, not what you thought was true and the lingering ideas about old studies that maybe have discounted, been discounted since that you're going to have to change something to overcome, you know, a lack of estrogen that was helping you. You had something in your corner and now it's not there. So we've got to pick up a little slack. One of those other things, in addition to resistance training, is the recovery between it, but also high protein. So a high protein meal will also boost muscle protein synthesis. So you may say at the end of the day, the total protein that I ate is is X. And I may say the total I ate is also X, but if I ate mine in meals of at least 30 grams of protein at each meal, mine would count more. If you have just small meals with little bits of protein throughout the day, you don't get that bump of muscle protein synthesis. It's like if you're supposed to take this this 10 milligram, and I, I am not a doctor and that's a guess, a 10 milligram dose of a certain pill and you decide, I'm I'm only going to take four milligrams right now. It's all I'm feeling. You know, you're not going to get the benefit of that medication. You would never do that. Like if somebody gave you, I want you to take these three penicillin pills today because you need it, you would never cut it in half and say, well, I'm not really feeling that. I'm just going to take part of it right now because that would not get you well, right? And similarly, it's true of, eating protein at one sitting. And the older we are, the more this is true because we are more anabolically resistant, meaning gaining lean muscle is harder. We have to work for it a little bit more. We have to keep it between the navigational buoys. We cannot go off the rails. We have to stay in the middle. So with estrogen being so very important when it's slow, we don't have the stimulus for muscle. We also don't have the same stimulus for bone. So estrogen is also very helpful for maintaining our bone density. That we've always known, but muscle is also true. So those are so they're both so very important when it comes to estrogen. So why you may look at, I've got to take this more seriously, strength training, walking, doing weight-bearing exercise, doing high impact if you can otherwise tolerate it, your your joints, your ligaments, your uh, bladder, you know, pelvic floor is strong. And you can do that. All of those things are very important. So that's estrogen. Okay. So let's talk now about your testosterone. Believe it or not, everybody thinks that women are abundant and the most abundant hormone is estrogen. It's not true. The most abundant hormone in our bodies is testosterone. We have less of it than males do. And, you know, it's harder for us to kind of manufacture it naturally, but there are things, lifestyle habits that we can do. Doing high intensity interval training can boost testosterone as long as you are not in a highly stressed period of time. So if you got a lot of stress going on, emotional, financial, relationship stress, or, you know, you're dieting or you're over fasting, maybe overdoing that, all of that is stress. And potentially it's not going to work very well if you're doing high intensity interval training too, that's, that's probably going to kill your testosterone. So too much of a good thing is not a good thing. 
but strength training, resistance training is a way to boost your testosterone. And think about the application of that because here's the kind of exercise that is not good for testosterone and that is chronic endurance training. So if you said you were going to do maybe 30 or 45 minutes of cardio, I don't call that endurance. It is cardio and you probably want to avoid getting in this mid zone that really doesn't count. Highs and lows are great. Like lay a foundation, go for as many walks as you want and do high intensity several times a week. But during high intensity, as well as during resistance training, what do we do? Well, we we are lifting weights for a minute, maybe, and we put the weights down and we get a break. So we we are boosting up our cortisol levels and then put them down and we get a little break. So when we elevate cortisol, we elevate our blood sugar a little bit, but we're putting it down. It's not coming up and up and up. Unlike chronic endurance training, when you go beyond about 45, 50 minutes for women in midlife, we see that cortisol continues to go up. It doesn't go up and then come down correspondingly even after exercise. It can be chronically high. And if you go chronically high for too long, ultimately you may end up chronically low. And that's not good either. Highs and lows, not good. Goldilocks in the middle, good. That's where we feel good. So if your cortisol is really low, You know, generally, you've probably been in a a chronically stressed situation for a really long time, maybe trying to push through and you're just, your tank is empty and you do need to do some things to try to elevate your cortisol levels. In fact, you may be given cortisol in order to do it. That may be, you know, some adrenal insufficiency, one of the four levels of that but can be fixed if you pay attention soon. Don't let it get worse. And many of us who are women who push through will struggle with that. Testosterone again. So we can benefit from that for muscle. So we have it as the most abundant hormone in our bodies, but we have to be careful. So chronic exercise of long-term cardio, it's going to deplete our testosterone. That means less muscle mass. And doing resistance training and HIT if we're ready for it. If we are apparently healthy, we're sleeping good, we have energy throughout the day, we're functioning pretty well cognitively, not a lot of stressors in our life, or we're handling them really well, HIT has a place, definitely a place. And when you increase your lean muscle mass, you help yourself with testosterone, you will feel the edge. There is a saying that goes boardroom to bedroom. Testosterone does that for you. So you feel strong, you feel a little bit more engaging, and you might approach your partner. I mean, that's all a little bit of testosterone. So, uh, all right, those, and let's talk about the third sex hormone, and that is progesterone. Now, in terms of exercise, we really don't benefit from it during exercise. We actually benefit from the effects of progesterone so that we feel like exercising. Progesterone is our kind of chill pill, our get a good night's sleep, get a good quality night's sleep pill. So if we have adequate progesterone, we're much more likely to get a good night's sleep. Your physician may be asking, you know, how are you sleeping? And they're hinting at wonder wonder where progesterone levels are. Progesterone and estrogen should be on an, an even keel. So if you're, you know, low in one or high in the other, you're probably not feeling optimal. So testing and testing again and and trying out your lifestyle habits plus if you're doing bioidentical hormone replacement making sure that you're measuring and monitoring on a regular basis to know okay now I'm in my sweet spot and then I can coast so progesterone again doesn't really play a role in exercise per se but plays a role in helping us feel good and motivated so we want to exercise but the two other hormones are not sex hormones, but they impact sex hormones and sex Im- sex hormones impact them. And they are cortisol and insulin. We've had them our entire lives. We will have them our entire lives. Whether you do or you don't replace your estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone, insulin and cortisol are there and they're going to be impacted. When estrogen does come down, your cortisol levels go up. That's kind of what happens as the body's way to stay in homeostasis. What we have to be aware of is that exercise is stress. So if you're doing too much stress, again, remember that long kind of cardio is going to elevate cortisol and keep it up. It doesn't have that corresponding down. When you're doing that, you're also elevating blood sugar. When cortisol is up, so is your blood sugar. And when your blood sugar goes up, insulin comes in. 
Insulin, think of it this way. Insulin is a fat fertilizer. When insulin is present, you're in a fat storage mode. Insulin is supposed to come in. It's supposed to do its job, but we have to be careful that it's not getting a surge all day, every day. You should have a little rise after meals. I mean, we can control some of that by going for a walk after meals to make it really a better way of nurturing our blood sugar by putting our muscles to work for us and having them use the blood sugar and draw it out of the bank of your blood instead of ultimately storing it as belly fat because we have four times the number of cortisol receptors in our belly as anywhere else. So is it any wonder, like when we're stressed, fat deposits in the belly, particularly when estrogen's gone down, cortisol goes up. Where does exercise come into play? If you're doing too much exercise relative to your personal needs, not to mine, not to your sisters, not to your BFFs, but you, you have to really be honest about how am I sleeping? How is my energy during the day? Do I feel like I need to put my head down at my desk at 2 p.m.? If you're not sleeping well, you're not feeling energetic throughout the day, chances are you have to be careful with your exercise that you're not overdoing it. Make sure you're doing things that give you a wake up, that boost your body, that take care of your body, but that don't throw you under the bus. Because if you're gaining fat, sometimes going after more exercise will actually cause more fat storage totally the opposite of what we've learned. Calories in, calories out. If I burn more calories and eat fewer calories, it will work. It will not. What you're doing is causing stress by eating less. Your body gets stressed. You're causing stress by exercising more. When you do both of those together, it's like a foot on the gas pedal, foot on the accelerator. What happens to your car? It burns out. So do you. So it won't work very well. So cortisol and insulin, when we have this conversation, we have to talk about them together. But exercise of the wrong type or the wrong time can also elevate blood sugar level because of the cortisol rise and therefore you have insulin. If you're somebody exercising a lot, trying to lose weight and it's just not working, you actually may want to come way back down. Start with walking short walks, not not long walks, light walks, not brisk walks, not power walks. Try some yoga, try some stretching, try something very, very different and gentle. Movement, yes. And let yourself release and reduce the cortisol levels and do something you love. Get outside. I'm sitting here staring at the window. Outdoors, reduces your cortisol by increasing your serotonin levels, your dopamine levels. If it's something you love, if you're walking next to a dog, you got a little oxytocin too, all of those when they're high, cortisol cannot be. So you're you're not getting rid of stress, but you are discounting the effect of stress on you. So it's really important to think about this when you go about exercise. It can't simply be you have to do cardio in X amount of minutes and X amount of days or strength training X amount of days and X amount of exercises and you have to stretch every day and you have to do this. All of that needs to go out here. Position statements and guidelines that we've used for decades, 42 years in the fitness industry and we have to throw them away because never, ever, ever once in my college career as an undergrad, as a grad student, 15 years of teaching in kinesiology, have we ever had a class, a course, even a single solid day of an hour talking about menopause to students or to our students as an instructor? Even as uh, someone who writes the exam questions for certifications, health coaching, personal training, and medical exercise specialist, I've written those exam questions. Never once in that whole textbook or in the testing process do we ask them about women in menopause, really women at all. The only the only thing we do touch on briefly, very briefly, is during pregnancy, how does the exercise change? And this is really an important thing to know. So now you know five hormones. So your estrogen is important for bone and for muscle, your testosterone also for muscle and somewhat for bone as well, progesterone just for the sleep that helps you feel like getting the exercise and moving more. 
the cortisol, we have to dance a careful dance so we're exercising enough to negate our cortisol for those who love exercise and not too much that we're actually making the cortisol worse, which will make the insulin rise and put us into fertilizing fat or in fat storage. I hope that helps. So think about whether you're on bioidentical hormone replacement, you want to consider it or not. If you have questions about that, let me know below. I will share with you some of my experts. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a physician and I don't diagnose. I do know anecdotally that the efficacy of the exercise prescriptions that we give at Flipping 50 work better, tend to work better the majority of the time for women who are on bioidentical hormone replacement because of what I've just said. The estrogen and the testosterone give you an edge when you've got them for building bone, reversing losses and gaining lean muscle. But it's not a decision everybody wants to make. So you can do it by making lifestyle changes yourself. Grab your questions down below, drop them, subscribe, ding the bell if you want to know when a new video is released. And let me know your questions of what you'd love to see a video on next.